a very warm welcome to you all. Welcome to those who've been with us from the start of our webinar series and those who uh, join us uh, today. This is a webinar series which was set up by the new research program, Patriarchal Inscriptions at King's College, the Asmi Humanities Research Institute. And it is uh, really our first sort of major uh, project with FGM and its various manifestations, various interpretations, activisms, at, right at the focus of this particular uh, series. We are incredibly grateful for the support given to us by King's College, by the Institute, but we are aware of the fact that the software we are using isn't perhaps entirely ideal. Uh, as it is not as interactive as we would like it to be. So we're trying to make up for this. Um, we are about to set up a YouTube uh, channel. And so that means that there's a you have sort of missed the uh, first webinars are able to catch up on that and we'll let you know when that is all uh, accomplished. We expect to be following this up with a publication edited volume and we might even have another uh, webinar, a follow up kind of symposium, maybe even face to face, who, who knows, uh, in spring of uh, the coming year. And everything else, uh, because these will be short introductions, short contextualizations, given time limitation, everything else you need to know about either the research program, the webinar series, the whole resin data of what made us uh, set up this whole research program, but also biographical information when it comes to conveners, presenters, contributors, all that can be uh, seen on uh, the King's College website if you look under patriarchal inscriptions. So there's plenty for, uh, of information uh, there to be had. So today is the fifth webinar and um, it comes under, it's the first of two sessions that come under a theme of mothers and daughters relationship. Um, and this particular theme connects very well with the last theme that we had in which we discussed, and there were lively discussions um, of ethnocentrism, uh, cultural and ethical relativism, subjectivism, and so on, um, and subjectivities. Um, so this particular theme discussions reach very much um, into uh, the last webinar, uh, and it's a difficult one because it reaches into this most intimate sphere of emotion, of attachment, love, belonging, sacrifice, dedication. And to situate the practices, the diverse practices of FGM and all the manifestations within this sphere raises to our mind, hugely uh, important uh, issues, not only about what it is we're looking at, but how it is that we arrive at a particular knowledge. It raises serious questions, the researcher, the activist, about the positionality of the researcher, um, the <laughs> issues about privileged knowing, the hierarchy, of knowledge that sort of has bedeviled yeah, Western feminist um, relationship with this subject matter. It raises the important issues of methodology, approaches, approaches, um, the equality in the process of conducting the research, partiality of knowledge. So I'm so glad that today's contributions and presentations raise these uh, important issues in terms of the different sources of knowledge, the different kind of collaborative relationships and the relationship between researcher and research community. After all, the women at the heart of um, these uh, particular discussions. So what it is there to be known, but how it is uh, to be known. We are having three distinct presentations. 
Um, and each will be followed by very brief uh, discussion clarification with the main kind of Q&A sessions right at the end of our session. And my colleague Comfort Moma will be coordinating this and be checking the Q&A box. As I was pointing out earlier on, unfortunately, this software doesn't allow for direct interaction. So please, any questions that occur to you, any feedback you want to make, any comment, place that in the Q&A box and Comfort will be uh, making sure, ensuring that this comes into the final Q&A uh, session. Enough of that. We now have our first two presentations. The first uh, presentation will be by uh, Giselle Potenier. She's a broadcast journalist, senior producer, director of important uh, documentaries that focus on women's human rights. She's also a co-founder of the NFGM network in uh, Canada. And she uses the medium of documentary filming to give voice to girls who found a refuge in a safe house in Tanzania. And that sort of, you know, relates back to uh, the presentation given by uh, the project Lester Linty, uh, a webinar on the 17th of October, uh, which sort of introduces his work. So Giselle will have more to say uh, to that. Uh, I will then introduce Mariam when it uh, comes uh, to that. So Giselle, if I can hand over to you, please. And absolutely. Um, Absolutely, and, and, and thank you, Maria, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor to be here today. Now, I want you to imagine you're an 11 year old girl on the cusp of puberty. You long to become a young woman, a respected member of your community. Every year, as long as you can remember in December, you've seen other girls go through a ceremony whether adored, celebrated, showered with presents. The girls are colorfully decorated, paraded to jubilation through the village streets. This year, it's your turn. And your mom has painted the experience as a day full of joy. Your aunties, your uncles are coming from far away. You'll finally be a young woman. You're super, super excited. Then a visitor comes to your school and talks about female genital mutilation about the pain, the potential lifelong physical and emotional implications to get that you may suffer. Is that what's going to happen? You're confused, you're torn, you're scared. Would your own mother lie to you? The visitor tells you about a safe house you can run to where they'll protect you. What will you do? If you stay, you will go through terrible suffering. If you run away, you shame your family. Worse. You may never see your mom again. It's a choice no young girl should ever have to make. And yet, it's a choice countless girls are facing. And it's the story of my documentary, In the Name of Your Daughter. I wanted to make a documentary about FGM for many years. For some reasons, it didn't happen. Funding was a big one. The other was a lack of interest by broadcasters who were afraid of this difficult topic. And in many cases, didn't think it was important enough. Imagine. They didn't think it was important enough. We now know that female genital mutilation is an issue in more than 90 countries, 90 countries and counting. We know that millions of girls are still being cut each year. And so as a human rights filmmaker, I really wanted to address this issue. As I looked around, I saw a number of films that have been made about FGM and several of them were really good. But I realized that no one had made a documentary that zeroed in on what I think is the most important aspect of FGM, the young girls themselves, the children whose rights are being violated. And so I decided to make a film to give these girls a voice. And I wanted to make a film that would touch audiences, that would make parents see these girls as they see their own daughters, as children, girls like other girls, girls with dreams, dreams that they have a right to pursue and girls whose rights to have those dreams must be protected. 
Well, I found Rogi Somwali in Tanzania, an amazing African woman who runs a safe house to protect girls from FGM. I realized that was the way to bring the girls' stories to the world. And so I started an Indie Global fundraising campaign where we raised 100,000 Canadian dollars uh, with people in over 40 countries. And that's essentially how the film began to be made. Let me show you a clip, a trailer of the documentary now. I call the film In the Name of Your Daughter because I made it in the name of every girl out there who longs to be free from female genital mutilation. I always talk about the film as a documentary about the bravest girls in the world, and I really believe that's what it is. These girls are so courageous in so many ways. They're risking their lives by running away, but they also risk losing their families, their mother, their community. Filming their stories was an incredible honor, but a burden as well, because we wanted to respect their dignity. And at the end of the day, what was most important to me is that when the girls themselves saw the film, they would feel that their trust in us to tell their stories had been justified. And of course, I had fantastic people with me on the ground, Tanzanians, all Tanzanians, women and men, who worked really hard to gain and respect the girls' trust. And it's because of their commitment and passion 
that the film turned out the way it did and that the girls, I'm happy and proud to say, have all said they feel their voices are being heard. And of course, I couldn't make the documentary in many other places with other people. There are safe houses elsewhere and other activists tirelessly trying to make change in their communities. But, you know, I think that In the Name of Your Daughter is in a sense their story too. What we see in the documentary, what we learn are truths that transcend from that one safe house to other communities and to other countries where female genital mutilation is practiced. And let me share some of these insights. Prime among them is this. Claims that girls voluntarily embrace the idea of female genital mutilation with joy and acceptance are simply not true. They're not true. What we saw in Tanzania and what we see in the film is that when a girl learns what's actually going to happen to her and she hears about the trauma that's about to take place, when she learns about the child marriage it often follows, when she hears it spells the end of the education that she learns for, when a girl learns about all that, she doesn't want to go through it. Not one single girl we met in film would said, yes, bring it on, after she heard those truths. What we did see were girls being tricked and lied to, and sadly, of course, even by their own mothers who thought they were doing the right thing by their daughters. It was tragic, really. What we saw were girls being bribed with the idea of gifts. What we filmed were girls that were bullied. And as we saw in the trailer just now, what we saw were girls who were threatened with death by family members if they didn't agree to be cut. These were real threats that the girl believed. That girl in the trailer was threatened by her own grandfather who told her he would kill her if she didn't agree to go through it. Every girl we met, given half a chance, would choose to remain intact, would choose to continue in school, would choose to remain with her family, to contribute to their community in a different and meaningful way. What we saw in Tanzania was a patriarchy very much responsible for FGM. It was men who were demanding that girls be cut. It was men who insisted that their sexuality had to be controlled. It was men who benefited most economically. And it was men who ensured that an uncut girl would become an outcast. Let me show you a clip to see, so you can see what I mean. Taylor? Uh, that's the wrong clip, Taylor. That's the same clip. I'm so sorry. That, good was the, that was the that was the other clip that you sent me this morning with the password. Uh, yes, that, but that's not this clip. Oh. I, I'm sorry, I think this is the only other one that I've received from you. Okay. Did you say, would it then be possible to, yeah, perhaps continue uh, walking? If, if there's no other clip, then just continue. Yeah, just one second. Mm. Uh, you sure I didn't send you that other clip? This is the one? That's the one. Oh, no, that's not the one. Uh, just give me just one second here. So, I'm sorry, we are asking for your patience. For okay. <laughs> All right. Look, it, do it does look that, um, and I apologize, that, that for some reason the wrong clip was sent by me, so we can show you that clip and I really, really am very, very um, disappointed by that. But let me just continue. So in that scene, what you, what you would have seen is uh, men who were um, telling us just exactly uh, why girls had to be cut. They talked about the economics of it. They talked about how a girl who is cut will fetch uh, more cows in bright price than a girl who isn't cut. Uh, you saw men who talked about that girls were unclean if they weren't cut. 
And we also uh, saw men who talked about their right to earn income from girls being essentially sold um, into marriage and that they had to be cut because um, when they were cut, there were all kinds of ceremonies that um, that took place and ways of the, the, the men um, making money. And perhaps most importantly in my mind, because it's it's the real reason that I've seen there for cutting, is they were talking about that a girl will be way more promiscuous if she isn't cut. So she had to be cut, so she would become more, as they called it, um, mature. And, and the significance of the scene was that um, it shows how complex and multi-layered, of course, the issue is. And it was a scene that we were very, very lucky to get because um, there, is a, there is a real silence in Tanzania about FGM because, uh, because it is, in fact, I illegal. And so we were trying very hard to get the men's point of view, but that was very tough. But it was on that day we had gone to a village with Bobi Samweli, who was trying to engage the community in her and FGM campaign. And when the men saw her there in the middle of the cutting season talking against FGM, they got really, really angry and they started yelling. And when they saw our cameras, they decided that they wanted to have their voices heard too. And that's how we, we were able to get some really important um, information through, through that clip. And of course, you know, we did see then how deeply entrenched a tradition this is and how difficult it is to try to make change. Um, I personally see female genital mutilation as the worst systematic human rights abuse committed against girls in the world today. And I see it that way for one reason, because it's often the entire community, men, women, and even children, who help to perpetuate this terrible harm, making it very difficult for activists to make inroads. As elsewhere in Tanzania, of course, it isn't just the men who are responsible for FGM. The men in Tanzania demand it, yes, but the women are the actual perpetrators, often with the mother physically present when her own daughter is cut. And this, as we all know, is, is a tragic thing because the girl has trust in her mother and it's her own mother that's doing the harm to her. The children too, of course, of the village, not knowing any better, apply peer pressure to other children and shame girls if they aren't cut. For girls and their mom to reject the cutting tradition means they might be rejected by the community and even face violence. For girls wanting to go against their own mothers, their need to belong to the community is intense. Their fear of losing the love of their mother is so real that it's really hard to move the needle on FGM. Probably some of the most heartbreaking scenes we witnessed were after the end of the cutting season, when Roby and her staff undertook reconciliation attempts between daughters and their parents. In some cases, these negotiations went on for literally, I am not kidding, hours, one, two, even three hours in one case, with both mothers and children crying. And sadly, many times the parents continued with their determination to cut their daughters, especially the fathers, and it was impossible to ensure the safety of the girl, so the child was returned to the safe house. But, you know, there is hope. The number of girls who are brave enough to run away to the safe house under their own steam is still small, but every cutting season there are more of them. The adult community of change makers is growing as well, with more and more teachers and village informers saving girls and getting them to the safe house, often with the help of the police. And mothers who used to think they were doing the right thing by cutting their daughters are now sometimes saving them from the harm they went through and are sending them to the safe house themselves. And they're doing so a significant risk to themselves because husbands are not always happy about this being done. Before I end, I want to share one small story about what happened since the film was made. With the help of the Canadian government, Roby has been using the film to help change hearts and minds. And I had the opportunity to be at the very first such village screening. The whole village, men, women and children, came to watch In the Name of Your Daughter under the proverbial jacaranda tree. The following morning, three young girls, just nine or ten years old, came to the safe house. One had been brought by her own older brother. That's change in the making. And some of the young girls who risked everything to escape female genital mutilation, girls who appeared in our film, are now becoming youth leaders, young warriors in a battle to end FGM. 
And I really believe it is this generation, their generation, perhaps with some help from their brothers, that will bring an end to FGM in Tanzania and beyond, hopefully by or before 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giselle. Brilliant. We're very sorry you were not able to show the second clip, but I think you made up for this, uh, you know, particularly the fun vignette, which something that uh, I was asking myself, the what would be the enduring, the lasting impact of that particular documentary and the collaboration you invited in making that. But we will have time in a moment to ask questions. Uh, may I now invite Dr. Mariam Racine uh, so, uh, Mariam is an uh, educator, she has a PhD in education, she's the director of a very powerful, influential uh, organization Forward, which is uh, headquartered in Frankfurt, uh, uh, Germany, and she is also the director of the Marfev project, and Mariam will be introducing to us this project, which is located in, Porto, in uh, Senegal, uh, and talking about the holistic approach adopted to empowering girls and women. Mariam, can I yeah. in invite you now? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> so, thank you very much for inviting me to the panel discussion today. Yeah, as you said, my name is Mariam So. I am managing director of the German charity Forward for Women, founded in 1998 in Frankfurt to fight violence against women with a special focus on ending FGM, female genital mutilation. Today, I will talk about our project Health and Education. My It seems that poor Mariam might be having some connection issues. We've just um, lost her momentarily. Can I suggest that maybe we move on to the next presentation while we try and bring her back? Maria, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I muted myself in the way that Mariam also uh, muted herself. Um, we've just been asked, uh, are we okay now with continuing with Mariam? Yeah, Annabelle, you have the slide. Yes, yes. Uh, that's not this one. <laughs> oh, did you mute yourself, Mariam? Accidentally. You heard me? You heard me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so everyone else, again, mute yourself apart from Mariam. Okay, sorry about this confusion. Okay, Mariam. Okay, do I I begin again or you you hear me? Uh, start, start. I start again. Okay, so like I said, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I am the managing director of uh, Forward for Women, founded on 1998 in Frankfurt to fight um, violence against women with special focus on female genital mutilation in the communities. But today I will talk about our health and education project MAFEL, which takes place in my hometown in Podo, Senegal. And MAFEL means in uh, English, everything will be fine. This project is about the right to reproductive health, the right to life and safe birth in Senegal. <clears throat> but just a point, the difference from the film that we see in Tanzania, uh, we see that to uh, begin with, it is interesting to see the di difference regarding gender roles and female genital mutilation in the film of G G G uh, Giselle Portenay and in Podo, because men do not get involved in the FGM in my ethnical group Fulani in Senegal, and it is important to focus only on this group 
and in Senegal, because somewhere else, the role of the man is also another role. It is uh, the women, only the women who are in, in charge uh, of this. It is very, very important developing FGM uh, prevention strategies in this um, uh, group um, how to see how to involve the men as partner and not as opponent. And this is a kind of the approach, the pedagogical approach that we that we uh, make. Slide two, Annabelle. Yes, you see Podor. Podor is located in the north of Senegal, in the region of Saint Louis, 400 kilometers from Dakar. Yeah, you can see how far it is from Dakar because um, in Africa, 400 kilometer is one day travel. No, that's not like 400 kilometer in Germany or in the European countries. This is very, very fine. In Podor, FGM, female genital mutilation, early marriage and forced marriage are practiced. As a result, there are many health complication, complications during childbirth, which often end deathly for many women in Podor. Slide three. Yes, support of maternity uh, uh, through training and this ambulance. You see this ambulance to ensure that Senegal will be able to meet the goals of sustainable development uh, 2030. Uh, selected women, so called Bajanugo, that they are health pilots, were trained to support the women from pregnancy to birth. With our project, we want to empower the Bajanugo, also these health pilots, uh, to provide FGM pregnant, uh, affected pregnant women. Uh, with even better information about venereal diseases, infections uh, such as fistula and incontinence and about treatment options. This year we managed to organize uh, the shipping of a donated ambulance that what you see here this is the, so the reception of the ambulance uh, from the ISB here in Germany we send it to Podor, as you can see in the in the picture. It's, it means also that um, we use the institutional skills that we have in Podor in order to build our project. Yeah, we are not inventing other things, but we see what is there, what can we use like the Bajanugoh, and we work with the Bajanugoh, but we are not going to build other people or the other uh, target groups, yeah? Slide number four. Annabelle. The new school, toilets, right, and water taps. In order to make sure that everyone in the school in Podo can use the bathroom during school time, especially girls and women, new toilets have been built. Many girls, because Many girls stay at home during their menstruation and this means up to 10 days of lection per month. So as a result, their equal opportunities for education are not guaranteed. So the absence of toilets is therefore a gender based discrimination. This year, new toilets are uh, for the boys were built as well as water taps from donations we receive. Now we are fundraising to build clean toilets for girls. And also this is really um, a topic that must be um, must be discussed and the uh, activists because um, for for me uh, it is important to have and pedagogical methods. Um, to build girls and we talk all the day uh, all the time about access to education but access to education means that in the schools uh, girls 
uh, the needs of girls in uh, regarding reproductive uh, health, like um, toilets if they have their menstruation, like uh, making uh, clean if they go to toilets, has to be part of uh, the programs. And sometimes we 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 forget it. It's like also for the teacher, the girl, the woman teacher. They are not also coming to the school if they had have their periods. So. The whole class can miss also <coughs> 10 days and also then we, we will not have in the in the in the future uh, women who are teaching also in the schools because that's not um, uh, they will not have uh, the skills that they need in order to feel good and to stay all the time in the school. That's the and then slide number five. Annabelle. Yes, that's the new school library. Together with the Scottish charity book feeding, we are setting up a library at the primary school Ecole Racine Cherso in Podo. As you hear the name, that's the school of my grandfather founded it in the in the uh, colonial uh, time. And uh, it is very important because many of uh, our ethnical group, they didn't want to send their children to the school of the foreign people that they don't know. So <clears throat> it was a big fight for my grandpa to say that these people are not going. So we have to send our children there to see what they, they, they want to do, their project and to know why. It was a very easy question, but very important for the community because it was the only school in the whole area and the first school. That's why the name in French is also Ecole 1, the first school he built. And that's why also in my family, many of them uh, um, go to the school because um, of my grandfather. And that's uh, for us. Uh, a good thing because <laughs> uh, my father was in the school, and all many of uh, uh, the member of my of my family. Yeah, for now the building has been renovated, and um, books uh, health were put in. The next step is to fundraise more money to equip the library with books in France and computers in order to have access also to other kind of information. The aim of the library is to improve access to education and thereby support girls from low income families in particular. The library is built in collaboration with the local community and this is also important for our project not to do it alone, but with the community in Podor. We set up there an association which names uh, Mafeu Association Mafeu uh, with the community who help at, us uh, set up the the project that we that we have together. Uh, mem and uh, it is important also to say at this point that uh, we want that the library uh, be after completing uh, the project will become member of the worldwide. Uh, book feeding project network. Uh, slide number six. Yes, and this is the safe house for girls and women affected by FGM. We also have a house. This is this one. What you see, it was also the house of my grandfather. <laughs> but as you see, it is very, very old, which we want to turn into a safe house for girls and women affected by FGM who need refuge like you saw in the trailer film of um, of Giselle, Giselle, of Giselle partner. Yeah, however, the house needs to be renovated and we need to be able to cover running costs of it. And that is important because this house is within the school. And uh, uh, the target group, all of my uh, the, the most of them, they are also in the school, so uh, they have um, the access to this house. If we get the money to renovate it, so we will have this house within a school, the school, and I think it will be a good thing. So far, we were not able to secure the fund 
funding for it. It is very difficult, especially since most of us do not work next to our do work uh next to our full-time job uh, when other family commitment and that's the problem also that we all the time had with uh, our work in forward because we are not working full we are working full-time somewhere else and all what we are doing in forward is just voluntary and in order to put up or to set up this kind of project we need to do it full-time and that's also uh, we must um, make a uh, fundraising for, uh, in order to 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 work only for forward. And slide number seven, I think that's the last one. Yes, how to get involved? Often time we are overwhelmed by problems and might think it is difficult or big. However, there is a very different way in which you can personally get involved yeah so thank you very much for the attention for your attention i am looking forward to discuss later on and if you have more questions you can also contact me via email thank you very much for listening Maria, yeah, thank you very much i mean you made a very persuasive case how effective education requires a gender sensitive gender-centered culture of education in terms of access, well-being, and so on. So, so thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Now, I realize that uh, time is somewhat limited, but I did promise uh, one or two uh, questions here. Can I ask Comfort, Comfort, can you see any, you know, from the Q&A that might come into that just for just a couple of minutes? Oh yes, we do have some questions. Um, do, do we have time for just two questions? Yes, you yes. Say? Okay, one of the questions says, does anyone have a sense of FGM practice in Kenet in ancient Egypt? That's one question. I'm not sure we will want to answer that. And another question says, considering the complication of FGM, why can't mother says no to FGM? Okay. Did you get that? Yeah. Uh, perhaps Sue, uh, Giselle? Yeah. Well, I, I certainly can uh, answer the, the question about why mothers can't say no to FGM, but I'm sure Mariam is probably even better placed than me. But um, in Tanzania, where I made my documentary, it is very difficult for mothers to say no, because if they say no, they too could become outcasts in the community. Um, husbands may, may kick them out, uh, may beat them up. Um, and uh, it is a patriarchal society, but it is also still very much women who enforce the demands of the men. So often mothers are, are forced by their own mother or by their mother-in-law to, to, to cut the daughter. So it's just very difficult to say no. It takes a very strong woman prepared to make some sacrifices to say no to FGM. But, I, you know, it is, starting, it is starting to happen. There are lots of activists around um, everywhere that are working at the grassroots level to make it happen. So we just have to be optimistic that we can empower women to, to say no and to, to stand up. Thank you, thank you, Philip. We need to sort of keep it short. Uh, uh, Giselle, sorry, um, comfort, another question? Right, can yeah. I, there's another one for, I think for Maria. Um, they say, this is from Suzanne Dance. It says, how long can they stay in this safe house? Yeah. Maria. Yes, first of all, I want to answer why mother uh, don't say no. Okay. Why are they going to say no if they think that, they, that this one is part of the life of their daughters? We, are, we also are not saying no to send our, our girls to the school. Maybe in 3,000 years, this kind of school that we have, with six you go to the Kita, with seven to the uh, school, um, uh, college, and then the university will be judged like 
something bad. And then, because this practice is like 23 or 4,000 years old. So the, the way we live now and we educate and socialize our, our daughter can be in 3,000 years or so something bad. And, but at this time of the history of the evolution is something good that we have in the society like a uh, uh, consensus. That's why they are doing, I tell you because I am affected and I know that my mom did it or my aunt because it was their, um, their duty na, to bring me through this cultural praxis in order to make me become the girl or the, 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 the woman that the, this society expect me to be. And that's why it's important to know the reason in order to prevent uh, FGM because it's good to give them another, um, to show them that another form of socialization and life is, is possible. And this modern society doesn't expect for any children, child to be cut. And that's our pedagogical um, uh, answers, so method. For the, the question, how long? It's all about this project. That's why we have a problem because we need fundraiser who will tell us uh, people you, we can help you to build this house and we can help you to have these children like they, um, the time that um, they must be there because our aim is not to keep them there but to bring them back in the societies and we don't really know how long it does take but this is a very very good point that we have to take on if we uh, do this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. And uh, I'll ask Comfort to keep an eye on the Q&A box to see what other questions emerge from that. Uh, it's It feels so cruel to sort of cut you off uh, in that, but we need to move on to our uh, next presenter. Really looking forward to Dr. Phil Lieberhaus' uh, presentation. Uh, Phil is a senior uh, lecturer uh, at Erasmus University College uh, in uh, Rotterdam and uh, her expertise in international relations and international law and the title of her presentation Mothers and Daughters Continuity, Love, Fear and Belonging Marginalization of Community Voices in Fighting Female Circumcision, Female Genital Mutilation, Female Genital Cutting and this project importantly is based on participatory uh, action research in Kisi in Kenya. And that's very, very important, this approach, because it undermines, undercuts, you know, the importance of power inequality, very much at the core of this presentation and its link with what Phil calls intelligibility gap. Phil, so can I hand over to you, please? Thank you very much for the um, introduction, Maria. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you can see my slides. Yes. OK, um, thank you. All right. Um, this uh, subject is um, something that I started having interest in um, a while back. Um, but uh, what I'm going to look at today is um, the laws on, pra on the practice in Kenya um, and a participatory action research and participatory action research in Kisi. What I'll specifically look at is what I learned from participatory action research um, um, when I, I went to Kisi. I don't know if the slides, if, I, if they're changing or I'm still on the first slide. I can't quite follow. They, they are changing. You can They're click changing. off to full screen if you wanted to, but we can see them perfectly. Oh, you can see them changing? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. All right. 
So um, I'm not going to dwell on the on the laws um, of the practice, but uh, one thing I just want to say is that um, Kenya is a party to all the conventions that deal with discrimination against women, except the optional protocol of um, the Convention on Elimination of uh, Discrimination um, Against Women. And it has different national mechanisms um, on how to eliminate the practice. Um, and uh, one of the main ones is the Prohibition for Female Genital Mutilation Act of 2011, which um, also incorporates the anti-FGM board. Um, one and another thing that I want to highlight is the pledge that was uh, provided by the president to end this practice in 2022. Um, as you can see, quite a few cases that have been um, um, uh, brought forward, um, including um, one um, that was uh, brought forward in 2017 where um, Dr. Tatu Kamau uh, wants um, the act to be uh, removed because she says it's against the constitution and it's against the um, uh, tradition of uh, many women in Kenya. Um, the judgment will be given in uh, December of this year. Now, in looking at um, the literature, what I saw as the challenges to these laws were the fact that um, while the government is supposed to provide support to the victims, um, there are quite a few reported cases. Um, and sometimes even when the cases are reported, even when the cases are taken to court, they're dismissed or the sentences are reduced. Um, and um, when it comes to um, um, the police getting people um, so that they can arrest them, um, this is poorly implemented. And sometimes um, because of this, um, the practice, um, the having of the practice has uh, kind of failed. Other approaches that um, are mentioned um, in the country in general are alternative rites of passage, promotion of girls' education, um, something that uh, was talked about by Giselle and Mariam, and um, providing alternative sources. Um, recently, um, there was an app that was created by uh, students um, in high school. It's called an um, iCut app, where um, um, girls who um, feel that um, the in danger of getting circumcised can uh, get in touch uh, uh, with um, maybe hospitals um, um, through through the app. The only problem with the app um, is that most of the rural, um, the girls in the rural areas don't necessarily have um, access to it. So before I talk about um, what I learned from participatory action research, um, uh, the reason um, um, I went to Kisi was because um, while reading the literature, it stated that the practice had declined in Kenya and Kisi was actually mentioned. And uh, my question was whether the law is what had sustained this decline, if at all there was a decline. So um, what I uh, embarked on doing was uh, to use participatory action research, uh, which is a, um, a, 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 a practice or a method that um, integrates a research action in a series of what we call flexible cycles that involve holistically rather than separate steps um, uh, when it comes to the collection of data, uh, the analysis, the interpretation of this data, and then uh, the planning and introduction of the action strategies that are going to be uh, taken. Um, okay. Um, so that's just a, a diagram that shows um, how this is done. So the aim is to have ordinary community members also generate um, new knowledge about issues and problems that they care about and through this is done through discussions that promote uh, personal both personal and uh, social change that's 
that's also just uh, the, the, the different key principles uh, for the practice. Um, but um, I'll just um, go to that slide and talk a bit about it. So um, basically what happens when, when you use this type of approach is you as the researcher have to participate uh, deeply within the community by working with the community. Um, um, it says helping, but I would say co-create uh, 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 um, solutions with the community itself. And this is something that um, has to be flexible because um, it's something that you always have to go back to and reflect. So once you find out what the problem is, you then look at how you um, what action you can take to solve the problem. And sometimes this uh, um, this might what you think is the problem might not really be the number one problem for the community, which is something that I um, found out uh, when I was doing this myself. So um, when we look at um, Kisi, so it's right there um, where Makasa is pointing to the western part of Kenya, and these are the different uh, um, districts, or we called little towns within um, within uh, Kisi province. Um, when it comes to female um, to to uh, the right of passage, uh, what they normally Call it is Esaro, um, and uh, this is just a part of a bigger um, uh, um, ce celebration, I would say, or a bigger uh, part of uh, activities that they go through called Chinyangi, which is a tradition of initiation both for uh, boys and girls. Now, um, the term that uh, Egesagane and Omoiseke at times that I'll come back to. Uh, Egesagane just simply means a girl and omoiseke means a woman. And uh, this is a term that I'll come back to Egesagane. Um, from the literature, uh, it's said that the prevalence is estimated at 84.4%. This is research that was um, done in 2014 and it came down from 96% in 2008. <laughs> And the highest prevalence is actually <laughs> medical, uh, uh, is, is, is medicalized. So a lot of the people in Kisi actually go to, um, uh, to the hospital for the procedure. Now, um, in order to, uh, uh, to collect my data, I did, uh, we, we did, um, and, and uh, I will say we because it was, um, two local researchers who, um, who assisted. Um, I had one um, student and myself, um, and we used interviews, observations, and focus group meetings. And uh, what did we uh, find uh, from the community? So according to the results, um, a lot of the um, um, participants say that it's used as a marker uh, to, to show that people have matured and it allows the youth to move to another milestone in their growth. However, many of the participants say that this used to be the culture with the people who were uh, circumcised um, and it was a process, like I said, where they'd be uh, secluded and given lessons on how to be good wives or good women in the society and the community. And afterwards, uh, there was a fist by the community or the neighborhood. But this is no longer the case because younger girls are now between the ages of six and eight or nine are circumcised and mainly secretly because the parents and the circumcisers fear that they'll be arrested. The lessons of the girls uh, that the girls used to get um, after the procedure are not being given anymore. And um, but some of the respondents say that um, the girls who are not circumcised are teased in school by the ones who've been circumcised and are called egesegane, uh, the term that I said. So they're considered young girls, irrespective of um, uh, their age. So um, some respondents say that um, the cut is just symbolic and it's just a small prick 
as opposed to cutting of the clitoris like they used to do back then, while some stated that the practice had no purpose in the current society. Those who supported the practice gave, of course, other reasons other than the right of passage. They said it's hygienic, um, uh, it's, um, um, it reduces the uh, woman's uh, sexual appetite, um, so the woman uh, will not have sex before marriage. Um, a few of them said that they just knew that it was part of the culture and therefore the older women in the community pressed them to do it um, on their daughters. Most respondents stated that now it's doctors and nurses who are actually performing the practice. Um, when it comes to law, um, majority of the respondents, including leaders, um, were not familiar with the Female Genital Mutilation Act. They just knew that people would be arrested if caught circumcising their girls. Most stated that they had, they they had before, they, they'd heard about the arrests in uh, different radio programs, and a few stated that an organization had come to teach them about the subject. When asked if any arrests were made, most leaders said they had not encountered any cases, but some community members stated that the chiefs and the police are bribed and that is why they do not make any arrests. Only two chiefs who, I inter uh, who we interviewed uh, stated that they, um, they'd arrested people who circumcised their girls, uh, but all the respondents stated that male circumcision, on the contrary, was allowed as a right of, of passage in the community and there were no laws against the practice. In terms of government involvement, most of the respondents stated that neither the government nor non-profit organizations came to speak to them about the subject, but the leaders stated that they brought up the topics in the different public forums that they have. Um, they also called them Baraza. Um, one of the assistant chiefs that I, I interviewed said that um, the leaders had received some training on female circumcision. A few respondents say that they were taught about the subject in church, and this was mainly the Seventh-day Adventist church. In terms of local organizations, uh, we managed to locate four local organizations, um, and these organizations were uh, doing different things. Some were providing um, um, education, to, uh, to, to, to different groups um, of women. Um, in, and it was not just education on female circumcision, but also other forms of uh, gender-based violence. Um, two organizations um, had a, what they called uh, uh, camp sessions, um, where um, they would hold camps for two weeks, for um, during the circumcision uh, season, which is normally during the um, holiday school holiday seasons, and that's in August and um, in December. And uh, um, some one of the community even uh, used community members uh, to assist um, when um, the, these daughters were being taught in terms of providing them uh, with food and other resources. One organization did things differently. They used value-centered approach method, um, which focuses on the needs of the community. So what they do is they teach the community, both men and women, on um, their female, uh, their, their genital, um, their reproductive organs, and um, the, this information is not forced upon them. But what they do is they use local multipliers like teachers and clan elders who are trained and then they disseminate the information to their families or in classes or in their neighborhood. Um, and so once they're given this information, then people um, um, decide for themselves whether they will uh, um, circumcise their daughters or not. Um, so, um, after uh, the interviews, uh, during some of the focus group meetings, um, we decided to look at uh, what the community would do in terms of um, um, the practice and the laws. Um, and a lot of them um, said that the pros and cons of the practice actually need to be given to the community members, especially the older women, and this needs to be done in Kisi language because these older women do not uh, understand English 
or Swahili, the two national languages. Um, the respondents also agreed that the medical practitioners should actually be stopped from uh, performing the, the, the procedure. Another point that was given was that um, more churches should be encouraged to talk to the church members because a lot of um, the community members go to churches. Most respondents agreed that the law was not um, really assisting in declining of the practice because many people were not aware of it and the administrators were actually not even arresting the perpetrators as, as required. Some said that um, the law, uh, because of the law, um, the uh, practice had gone underground. One participant who is uh, the program coordinator of an organization said it would help um, if um, this, um, the issue of uh, female circumcision was looked at alongside other issues like health or economics. So female circumcision, for example, is so integrally linked with the economic and social realities of the everyday life that its eradication requires a fu fundamental transformation of the societies where it exists. Um, and when we talk about the economic um, uh, uh, aspect of it, um, according to the respondents, doctors and nurses are actually making a lot of money from performing this procedure secretly. Most respondents stated that the more pressing issue actually was enhancing themselves economically. And this is where I said uh, I then had to be flexible. And uh, what, I, um, what I then did was I went back um, to look at what they meant by being economic, economically, um, uh, to, um, and to and what they meant by saying they wanted to enhance themselves economically. Before I left, I found um, that um, a lot of them had joined uh, different um, uh, different uh, self help groups. Um, and um, what they did in these self-help groups was they would remove money um, and, and um, help each other. So kind of like saving uh, uh, for, for each other. Um, and um, according to, to literature, um, female circumcision is used as bride price. Again, uh, something that uh, uh, um, Giselle and Mariam talked about. And um, it's considered an alternative security um, for the families because um, once the girl is circumcised, then um, they can um, they can be married, and uh, for them to be married, the person who's marrying them uh, will provide a bride price or dowry, which then becomes um, an income for 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 their family. Um, and so what what I did was in looking at whether how um, how the women were benefiting from these self-help groups, I also looked at the challenges they were facing. And one of the challenges I wanted to look at was culture. Um, so to see whether um, either a patriarchy or uh, and uh, female circumcision were some of the cultures that were setting them back. Um, what um, what what I um, what before I go to what we found most of the uh, while most of the um, uh, women say that um, they were in these self help groups for um, for for economic enhancement actually majority of them um, said that the most benefit that they got from the group uh, from the these groups was social benefits um, and the social benefits that um, they talked about were um, that they would talk about what's going on um, in the family and uh, what um, they, they would also talk about uh, female circumcision and they would get um, um, they would get um, education. Um, those are a, a group that would come in and, and provide education for, uh, to the women, uh, adult education, because a lot of them um, had not gone to school. And um, something else that I found was that um, uh, female circumcision was actually not a barrier, 
On the contrary, some of the interviewees um, from some of the self-help groups stated that they managed to bring up the subject on the practice and during their meetings and they discussed how to overcome it. Uh, members of one um, self-help group said that uh, an, uh, one of the local organizations came to provide adult education to them and during these workshops they um, also spoke to these uh, um, groups on um, female circumcision and then they were requested to act as agents and speak with their families and um, community at large about the disadvantages of the practice. This was actually confirmed by the program coordinator of this um, organization who stated that they did indeed provided these workshops um, um, on the disadvantages of the practice and the fact that it's outdated and they combined it with um, adult education since most of the members in this um, self-help group were not educated. When it comes to education, uh, based on the finding, um, female circumcision um, is not by itself a barrier to the enhancement of women. Um, based on the results, edu educating women to become economically enhanced can actually have an indirect effect on female circumcision because the education can cover various subjects as we saw with the, with the um, organization uh, and the one self-help group. So both issues can uh, do not have to be looked, in, 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 uh, looked at in isolation, but as part of the everyday challenges uh, that the community faces. So after uh, uh, the discussion, um, one thing that we looked at was what was the underlying issue um, and what we found was that the underlying issue was actually corruption and this um, corruption includes um, I will not um, give um, uh, what um, I'll, I'll only give one aspect where female circumcision is concerned and this is where when the uh, police are called to come and arrest someone because they um, they're about to take their daughter to be circumcised or they have already taken their daughter to be circumcised they come and get um, 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 get bright and then they don't uh, make their arrests uh, Phil, Phil, yes Phil, Phil, the voice the of the voice chair, chair Phil, because we are running out of time, is it possible to sort of come to findings and so on? Because yeah. you're sort of, yeah, I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Um, I think I already did the findings. I just wanted to 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 go to the community mobilization where the, um, uh, uh, the action of the community, where the community said that they um, they needed to have community mobilization and they needed civic education in order to know what their rights were. And um, what we also found was that while there was different organizations and they're all doing good work, they were also doing it in isolation. So um, what um, we also um, suggested was maybe that there should be cooperation among the local organization. Um, in the follow up, um, what I found was that there um, the community, there's so many community members who are working um, on uh, with the girls, uh, be it uh, mothers, be it their sisters. Some of the uh, um, interview interviewers, interviewees stated that um, they stopped their young sisters from being circumcised. Um, local organizations, um, more local organizations are working together. Um, community uh, members themselves are making sure that um, they are working with the girls. They are going to schools to talk to the girls, not just about uh, female circumcision, but also about uh, hygiene. And the main problem that was there when I went back again for the follow up, which is teenage pregnancy. There are also several public gatherings where um, some of the community members even create skits. Um, around what their the uh, everyday issues are. Now, how do I uh, tie it back to to the um, to today's um, less um, topic? Um, what I found, what I observed, is that the Kisi people themselves use holistic nuance uh, responses to address the underlying issues that sustain gender inequality. I also learned that while women wanted economic empowerment, they 
were actually helping themselves more with um, social empowerment. And uh, what I realized is that rural, rural women are agents against gender equality and are catalysts of a very sustainable development. Um, but there's a need to understand um, that they are also providing information, albeit that it's a different way of providing this information. And what we all need to do is to learn from this community's experience, um, which are informative and enriching. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Phil. This is absolutely brilliant. And what your particular methodology approach enabled was to bring out the multiplicity of positionalities, of perspectives, of interests, of agendas, and the implications of all of that. Um, thank you so much. Can thank I you. ask Comfort, because in the interest of time, Comfort, uh, we may not be able to have more than one question. Is there anything there that appears to you might be brought in before we continue? Yes, we do have so many questions. Um, OK, first of all, I'll quickly say these. Um, Somebody wanted to know from G um, Giselle if how they can access the whole documentary. So quickly on that one. And um, there's a question that says, does FGM features as part of edu as part of sex education? Right. What is the status of sex education in the society? Mm -hmm. ah, yes, I just wonder, I mean, these are very important questions. I wonder maybe if we could park these and leave them to the end of our session. I'm slightly sort of anxious uh, to have two more presenters here come to the fore. And if there is no immediate question, particularly of Phil, in terms of uh, clarification and issues, um, I wonder if we could give everyone a bit of time to think through that because there will be, I think, some very urgent question to be asked. And instead, if we move to our, you know, final uh, two presenters and then leave everything to you, a comfort to sort of okay. bring out, yeah, the questions. I hope this is all right. This sort of a really special kind of uh, decision here. Um, so we have under our particular session theme of mothers and daughters a uh, third uh, um, uh, title. Uh, this is a uh, combined sort of presentation. It comes from uh, someone we all know very well. That's Professor Toby Levin von Leichen, um, who is an uh, activist, writer, publisher, academic. It comes from the background that is important to uh, the subject matter here of the presentation for the background of comparative literature. And Toby will make clear why this uh, matters. Um, she's also visiting professor here at King's um, and on the research board, African American Research, uh, Harvard University. And um, the other presenter is Kriet Herzberger Bofana. Uh, has a, also developed in literature, a member of the European uh, Parliament. And again, forward, uh, uh, um, it turns up again in that uh, Piet is the president of Forward um, uh, Germany. The uh, title, No More Oversimplifying FGM in African and African Diaspora, uh, memoirs exploits here in both cases the riches of the memoir genre here and to give uh, the possibility of more subtle uh, analysis of complex shifting um, and dynamic interactions through which to shape subjectivity, uh, negotiated choice, strategic uh, agency. So these are memoirs of home but also of dislocation of diaspora and the impact on the hold and tradition of uh, FGM. So if I can invite Toby mm -hmm. to come to the microphone, so to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open my PowerPoint, hopefully. Hopefully that works. Well, it worked very well. What do you, what do you know? Um, almost very well. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, yes. I have to move you here and get to the slideshow. Here we go. 
So you have introduced me, so I will start by saying that I met the late Ethelwador Canoe, who many of you revere as a pioneer in anti-FGM advocacy in 1978. In 1998, she encouraged the founding of Forward Germany, on whose board Mariam Piret and I have served. Dedicated teachers of language and literature, Piret and I have enjoyed careers as public intellectuals, opposing racism and excision, and publishing on female genital mutilation in memoirs and fiction. Given that most research on FGM emerges from the social sciences, medicine, and law, we are exploring the added value the humanities bring to the field. As I suggest elsewhere, art is empathy's midwife and empathy motivates action. But if doubt exists about the role stories play in the quest to improve people's lives, let's look at one exemplary study in the journal Science. Authors Castano and Kidd found readers of literary fiction scoring significantly higher on tests of empathy to be expected because behavioral change isn't driven by reason alone. Rather, <clears throat> quote, appeals to irrational motives, end quote, that surface when people indulge in art, broadly conceived, can spare girls from the blade. Therefore, concerned scholars may be overlooking a potent correlative in novels, drama, film, poetry, personal narrative, radio plays, soap operas, comic books, song, dance, painting, sculpture, and more. Given the centrality of the arts in our daily lives, this research gap is distressing. Time constraints limit this paper to only two examples, but you'll find more in an ongoing project that includes my personal favorites, Hebo uh, Wardir's Cut, One Woman's Fight Against FGM in Britain Today, Noura Abdi, Tränen im Sand, not yet translated, so you'll have to rely on the German version. Laurelind Bowen, Swimming in a Red Sea. Soraya Mire, The Girl with Three Legs. And Maria Kaminta, Kaminta A Maasai's Fight Against Female Genital Mutilation. And I'll add to these memoirs a fine drama by Nick Hadikwa Mwaluko, Wafrika123. Today, I'm presenting a memoir by Kadi, Mutile, 2005, also called in English Bloodstains, which I translated, and a drama by Linda Veille-Curiel, Le Paris de Bantou, or Bintou in Paris, <clears throat> followed by an animation by Janet File and Leila Hussein. I also reference Alice Walker's novel, Possessing the Secret of Joy, and a documentary, Warrior Marks. Now, in these works, the mother-daughter theme stands out. After all, haven't we often wondered why a cut mother approves of her child's excision? Don't we all have loving mothers and as mothers, don't we love our girls? What then makes this treacherous phenomenon legible? How can we reconcile the so-called act of love with the resulting debility, pain, and mortal risk? <clears throat> and what about the influence excision has on mother-daughter bonds? Does the wounding damage break or in the eyes of supporters, strengthen maternal and filial ties. And moving beyond individual psychology, let's consider global governments, governance, human rights covenants, and sustainable development goals. How <clears throat> are political aims impeded by disuniting women? Finally, how does FGM compare to other abuses that fracture women's inclination to identify and support one another and instead to choose complicity with systemic injustice? Yet, do mothers really choose complicity? Aren't they rather constrained, smothered by silence? Quote, even though they had all lived through it, Kadi remarks, why had our mothers never told us about the physical and psychological harm?" End quote. The dilemma is well described in an article whose epigraph quotes Walker, resistance is the secret of joy. In From Betrayal to Power, the authors ask, 
What does it mean to love a daughter in a culture hostile to her integrity? In a culture where power equals dominance and superiority, men's control of public life places mothers in a double bind as their daughters approach womanhood. Mothers commonly guide daughters along the paths of least resistance, asking them to straddle the cultural division of work. As girls find that they cannot enter patriarchy fully and powerfully as themselves, they feel betrayed by their mothers. But mothers did not create the separate spheres of public and private life. It is this cultural betrayal of human integrity which divides our wholeness into separate spheres. Shedding light on the public-private split, political scientist Ute Gerhardt calls for Gleichheit ohne Angleichung, or equality without equivalence. Women need not be the same as men to claim equal rights. In the literature, <clears throat> mothers support their daughters by selecting among alternatives. For instance, in Dimna Ugu Oju's What Will My Mother Say? A tribal African girl comes of age in America. The narrator arcs between conflicted gender definitions that include FGM understood as enhancing a woman's life in Nigeria, but she rejects it in America. Iconic in this culture clash is 11-year-old Delia romping with her brothers. Her emigre father berates her, not for wrestling, but for neglecting chores. When asked why she is assigned more work than they, he responds, because they're boys and you're a girl, and it's time you learn that. <clears throat> Yet Mother Dimpna, conservative vis-a-vis -vis her own gender roles, defends Delia, claiming girl or not, she can accomplish whatever she wants. This in turn presupposes education and career, a view of culture then not as static, but in diaspora increasingly plastic. In Kadi's Mutile, or Bloodstains, a diasporic memoir, the mother-daughter bond is similarly pliant, stretching as the protagonist gains in discernment and agency. Influenced by Awa Tiam's La Parole Negresse, 1978, Kadi begins to question what she as a child had always taken for granted. The barbarity of FGM, she writes, hit me full force when in 1982 in France, excision killed a little girl from Mali, Bobo Traoré. For a long time, I had simply accepted mutilation, including my own, to such an extent that my first three girls had been victims of it. But the loss of that three-month-old in Paris served as a wake-up call. It aroused French uh, society and not a small number of Africans as well. Kadi was thus inspired to join and ultimately lead a movement to end it. Quote, it's a matter of dissuading mothers from perpetrating on their girls, born or coming, the barbarity they suffer for life. But obstacles to abolition loom when excision links to forced, early, and arranged marriage with serial pregnancies. Quote, in Solenke tradition, when a girl is born, a female relative attaches a piece of cloth to her wrist, which means I'm reserving her for my son. So you had the arranged marriages that took for granted the daughter would be excised, since no Sononke worthy of the name would marry a, quote, impure girl, end quote. This lobs the ball back into the men's court. Yet it is women who mourn, quote, I carried the burden of remorse for having my daughters done, Kadi admits. As a sought after talk show guest, she found a certain interview disturbing, quote, it concerns my children, she says. One time on television, the moderator asked, are your daughters excised? Revealing their, quote, intimate wounds to the world troubled her deeply, she writes, but she couldn't lie. Yes, I said, and the answer made me sick. Connie hopes her daughters will forgive her. The memoir doesn't tell us if her wish comes true. What we do learn is that her advocate's resolve intensifies. As president of the first European network of, of NGOs, she cultivates allies and especially men. Quote, in certain countries, serious imams correct misunderstandings of the Quran as preached by less well-educated peers. 
The high respect in which they are held gives their words weight, and many of these imams are now on our side. One such enlightened imam is crucial to the denouement in Bintu in Paris. In, in brief, Bintu arrives from Mali to join her husband Adama in Paris. He expects she will have the baby excised, she will have had the baby excised. On learning she has not, Adama refuses to speak to her. And when Dawn finds the crib empty and Adama gone, Bintu's only thought is that the child has been taken to the Exizus. Joining her sister, the panic duo sprint to a northern arrondissement of Paris. Together, they assault a door. It opens cautiously. No, with a stern expression, the cutter replies, no one has been here this morning. Cut to Bintu's key, unlocking the door to find husband Adama already home. Where is she, shrieks Bintu rushing to cuddle her tranquil daughter. I've changed my mind, the father states. She'll never be cut. In 1994, attorney Linda Vecuriel, whom you saw on the previous slide, produced the educational fiction Bintu in Paris. The film ends with an immigrant patriarch's vow to spare his daughter, thereby marking a paradigm shift that has plausibly emerged from community discussions and persuasion. Linda agreed with African anti-excision groups who deprecated prosecution unless accompanied by instruction. Thus, the story featuring only Malian actors set in venues frequented by the diaspora suggests that immigration, education, and jurisprudence together promote saying no to the cut. How does the drama argue? Decisively, Adama consults an imam who assures the circle of men that Holy Scripture doesn't require excision. Thus, the faith, faith leader tips the scales. As the all African gas makes clear, authority invested in individuals by community consensus can migrate from the traditional trustees of culture, the father and his mother, to the upstarts, a younger female cohort. Now, the self-assurance with which Bintu's mother-in-law pursues genital ablation reveals how invested the older woman is in her clout, backed by majority opinion to do so, but the father's change of heart thwarts the elder woman's right to make the call on a grandchild's mutilation, enabling a junior maternal generation to resist. The complex conundrum has been brilliantly captured in the second of three animations welcomed in Parliament in 2017 by executive producer Janet File and associate producer Leila Hussein. So we'll watch this uh, three minute clip and um, then discuss it in the Q&A. Taylor, we're ready for the clip. <clears throat> my daughter, I've wanted so many times to try to explain, but it's been so difficult all these years you've suffered. The day they took you and your sister, I couldn't stop them. I did what I thought was best for you. So you would have a good husband, children to be happy. We didn't want you to be different from the other girls. You know what people would have said. They would think our girls are wild. I really believed it was right. It's what's always been done. Looking back now, I see you struggling just like me. All these years, I never felt like leaving the house. I couldn't face it. I've been stuck at home, alone, feeling ill and not knowing why. The pain, the agony when it comes to, to sex, not being able to satisfy our husbands, it's how it's always been, but we couldn't tell people. It's our dark secret. I was so happy when I fell pregnant with you. 
but the difficulty giving birth. This and this, it nearly killed me. My family said I was cursed. After I had you, your father never wanted me again. I blamed myself, but nothing prepared me for how much you would suffer. The first time you were in hospital, I didn't understand. Your health problems, the years of incontinence parts, all the infections, the operations. And by doing the very thing I thought would give you a good husband and marriage, it has ended so badly for you. I don't know why we tell ourselves it's what men want when they don't. The affairs, the divorces, we should not be doing this. No one should ever do this to their girls. All I can tell you now is that I love you. Thank you. Um, if I can cut into the credits already. Thank you very much, Toby. Mm -hmm. Poignant and affecting. Can I ask uh, Pierriette, that's Pierriette Herzberger Fofana, to please yeah, come to the microphone? Pierriette? Pierriette, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, can you see me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, and we can hear you now, Pierre. Okay. Thank Good you. evening. First of all, I want to say thank you for this invitation. And maybe because before I start with my paper, I just want to say something new. What happened to the European Parliament this year on the 12th of February? We uh, start. Uh, we uh, we had a uh, resolution. We made a resolution. And this resolution was accepted by most of the parliament, of the MPs, uh, uh, so that we want now really to do everything so that we abolish the FGM in Europe. And I think it's a great thing because that's the first time that the European Parliament deal with FGM for Europe and had a resolution. And I have to say we had two uh, uh, two events in the parliament. One it was with the NFGM and I have seen now just now it was a, a small film of FGM and another one it was with uh, Hadi and uh, Mrs. Vale. And it's really uh, interesting and uh, encouraging to see that the MEPs now and the most of the um, people in Europe, in the parliament, want really that something happened, that we really uh, abolish that. Just now, what am I speaking? I am just speaking now about novelist, is an African literature, is something else. And uh, I am so sorry because we, our PowerPoint didn't, we couldn't give our PowerPoint, it will be paused for the next time that the FGM seen by the African women novelists. Within the context of campaigns to end FGM, what explicit stances have been taken by African creative writers? How has their opposition been received? 
I want to give an overview of fiction and memoir, mainly by insiders to their culture, who challenge the right to the writ of accession, moving from acquiescence in Flora Nwapa and ambiguity in Gugi to the direct challenge of other authors like uh, Wariziri, Radi, Diariatu, Ba, Fauzia, Kassinda, and, and so on, for whom the amputation of the clitoris or stitching of the vulva has no place in the 21st century life. We must, must dare to shout, stop. I would like to focus on these novelists. They have like uh, this one, because the novelists have had the courage to raise their voices and thus reveal all the taboos related to female genital mutilation, like forced marriage, go hand in hand with the custom. Diaria to Ba is one of them. But first of all, can you remember what Worris Deary wrote? She wrote in her book, Desert Flower, if God felt that certain body parts were superfluous, why did he create them? To demand that an anachronistic custom be abolished is not malevolent, nor does it exhibit a weakness for white habits. It simply means acknowledging that although physical and mental violence is taking place in full view of humanity, a feminism buries it under the shibboleth of culture. The truth is, that the health of millions of girls is at risk, sacrificed to backward beliefs and so-called venerable traditions. Sadly, we find any number of novelists who deal with the subject and yet fail to cry, stop, while others in their fiction simply remain incritical. Let's take, take just one. Just one example, like Flora Noapa in A Furu. The novelist that describe preparation for excision without in any way questioning the custom. Once Ephraim's husband comes home and he informs that his wife will soon be exercised since, how he said, quotation, it must be done now. This is the time. Let's not leave it until she gets pregnant. Presenting the custom from the perspective of Igbo culture, in which it is so deeply embedded, Noapa naturally uses the euphemism to take a bath, meaning clitoridectomy, the ceremony recommended to precede marriage, though it may be postponed until just before the first baby is delivered. Why? According to local belief, removing the offending organ is essential to avoid endangering the infant's life should his head come in contact with the clitoris. Noapas invites this conviction into a plot at the point where Noakego mothers is criticized. By wanting to spare her daughter the trial of excision, she accused of having promoted the death of a male infant. Thus, the novelist introduces her readers to a feudal society whose cause is simply accepted. Her sympathies are with the ex -Caesar. far from being portrayed as the African sorceress, a story and legend. The elder midwife's motive are good as she provides aftercare, wholly concerned with the well-being of the patient and even refuse to cut should the woman be pregnant Ironically, however, clitoridectomy's dangers and pain also appears to be clear to his victim since the excesses promise to minimize them. And she said, I will be gentle with you. Don't be afraid. It is painful, no doubt. But the pain disappears like hunger. The narrator therefore accepts that excision confers on women the status of fully feminine as they tell the initiate. Noble, my daughter, it is what every woman undergoes, so don't worry. For Napa, mother of Tank in Beyala's novel, is it another point of view? The book, Tutapelha Tanga, 
not necessarily purity for its own sake, but rather than the mercantile aspect dominates all other considerations. Deviating from its original signification, excision has become for the parents a means of appropriating their daughter's body like merchandise responding to economic law of supply and demand. Ngapa, a reaction, dancing and emitting cries of joy in anticipation of the benefit she will draw from her daughter prospect, highlights existence in terms of mercenaries' motive. Tanga has been obedient to her mother's will only to satisfy the older woman's lust of look, blessing herself for the sake of a suspect honor in the hand of the clitoris snatcher, as she said. Such frontal attacks on FTM also lead retrograde voices in the African press to react, showing just how much territory is left for activists to cover. With the publication of their autobiography, the tone changed in the works. The three women I am going to, sh to show now give an insight into their own lives and the tra trauma that follow. The trauma of existence also can play a role in Katusha. Uh, in French, it's not uh, translated in English, dans ma chair, in my flesh. Katusha was a former, like Waris Diri, she was a former top model from Guinea. And like many others, that book received relative silence in France and also in Senegal. After her death, the book has been republished and it was a film on that. Katusha was a fa fashion icon of the 90s who died on the 4th of February 2008, was one of the first to impose black beauty on the catwalks of international haute couture. A look back at her tumultuous career in the light of her autobiography, Darmacher. While the whole world was celebrating the Day of Zero Tolerance against female genital mutilation on February 6, 2008, the French-speaking media headlined I'm sorry. sorry, they have French speaking headlines the disappearance of Katusha by her real name, Katija Tunjian, the daughter of a renewed historian and professor at the University of Conakry, Jibril Tamsinyan, the author of Sunjata the Mandinga, and also the author of the general history of Af uh, African history. With his wife, he had not hesitated to subject his daughter to his ritual without her own consent. Katucha was born in Conakry, 1960, and reveals in her confessional autobiography that she was exercised at the age of nine in her hometown by a woman doctor. This traumatic operation will determine the course of her life according to the principle that the wants of childhood remain open ones. Recalling the scene, she described it as follows, but you know I leave it. And what she said, but that her parents were not uh, capable, uh, was not, couldn't uh, help her. Why? Because in Africa, the other age, the tradition, the heritage of the elder must be respected, whatever your condition. You can be a wealthy bourgeois or a professor like her father with a lot of diplomas. If you don't bow to the custom of your ancestors, you and your descendant will be ostracized by society. As we can see also, the parents of Katusha highly educated, they didn't have the courage to oppose to the tradition. And that's a big challenge for all the women now who, uh, who write a biography and have to face with that problem. I just want to come to another one. Uh, also uh, inter Henriette, Henriette, yes. So sorry. Um, this would be all right. I'm so sorry because it's fascinating. Another five minutes. Would that be all right? Would that suffice? I, I come to the resume to the end. Uh, to uh, yeah, yes. I come to the. I come to just to have time for questions. Well, yeah. Can you give me five minutes, please? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Sorry. Yes. So just the, the to suffice, Mark. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, uh, 
I, I'm so sorry, yes, because yes, I, am, I came on the felt my, okay, this is my fault. I give the end of my, my problem. Uh, which, uh, uh, so, just when I, I see that like that. The two other women I wanted to speak is two women who uh, have been, one who have been in Germany and uh, she fled, it was uh, Kassinja, she fled from the Togo to, uh, to Ghana, from Ghana to Germany and then came to the United States where she was the first woman who get asylum in, uh, in the United States. And the second one is a young woman, it's Diaratu, Diaratu, who has another, uh, who was faced with the uh, forced marriage at the 13th with an old man who was so who said he was working at the uh, European Union and it was not true. So, so I can give that at the end. Uh, so I give that right at the uh, let's. Uh, okay, let's give that Hadi said the last words of my. Pepper, Hadi, as you know, everybody, the president of La Palab and the first uh, president of the European ne network against FGM rights. Mutilated as a small child, married before adolescence, pregnant before I had become an adult, I had known nothing but submission, and so it sorts is what men want for their pleasure and what women perpetuate for their own regret. Like Cadi suspects that benefits a conformist exterior, there is in fact more opposition than many suspect much of in the truth of fair. Yet, even if the majority says, as she said, I was cut and leave sulfid, so why shouldn't my daughter experience the same? I am so sorry because I wanted to. Excision remains last week, remains a traumatic experience. And behind every girl, girl with exercise, there is a woman who will have to live and give meaning to the mutilation of which she was the innocent victim. All these biography do not enjoy us to go to war against tradition, but commit us to listen to the new voices that challenge us and tell us about their hopes, dreams and expiration. Thank you for, for your... Ed, Ed, thank you. Thank you very much. My most profound apology, because the points you've made, the insight you brought are profoundly poignant and important. And thank you for this fantastic yeah, range of presentations today and the importance yes. of coming together from this background, disciplines, uh, methodologies. And I hand over now to Comfort. We are running a bit over time. It doesn't matter a few minutes that will do. And uh, because at the end, we will also have a discussion, Ali Motu. Uh, Comfort. <laughs> Comfort, uh, unmute, please. Unmute, Comfort. Oh. Comfort. So sorry thank about that. Thank, thank you so much, Maria. And thank you to our speakers um, for identifying the complexity of FGM. Very complex issue. And also thanks so much um, to the European Parliament for their resolution on FGM. So we have so many questions. Um, first, a question from Karina says, thank you for, um, thank you to the presenters. May I ask if there is a religious aspect of FGM or is it mainly cultural? That's one question. And I'll just put two to you, then you answer and then I'll give you more. And there's another one that says law alone cannot end FGM. They need to apply alongside education on the right, on the education on the rights of women and girls. We also need commitment from the government. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that or shall I put all the questions on and then you decide who answers them? Maybe two questions first, maybe initial okay. questions. Okay, we'll go with that two questions first then. Speakers, can you hear me? Um, 
Am I, I'm not muted. If I'm un, I'm unmuted, right? Uh, we we I, can't see your face. You're not muted anyway, but we can't see your face, Toby. Yeah, but I don't know why that is. You could see me, I hope, when I was speaking, right? Not I, really. Oh, my goodness. I have no might idea why that inviting, is. Might you be inviting Giselle, perhaps, to start answering the first question? Yeah. That would be a good idea. Uh, hello, yes, uh, I think the first question is about uh, is there a religious aspect to FG, FGM, FGC? Yeah. And I think um, in Tanzania, what I can report, very interesting, uh, in all my time there, I did not ever hear anyone justify FGM in the name of religion. In fact, at the safe house that we featured, the girls that were there, it was exactly one third, one third, one third. One third were Christian, one third were Muslim, and one third were animist religions. So in Tanzania, it was not to do with religion, but, we, but I think we all uh, know that religion um, is often used as an excuse, although there appears to be no justification for it in any religious text mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Comfort, we have not given Phil an opportunity to come back. Maybe Phil might be able to come into that. Yeah. OK. OK, in, yeah, the, the question on sexuality, sexual education. Sure. Um, in, in Kenya, even though um, there was um, a declaration that was signed that sexual education would be provided in schools. A lot of schools are not providing this education because um, they're very conservative. They look more towards um, abstinence. Um, and this is not no different from uh, from Kisi. But what actually is happening in Kisi, or at least what happened when I was there, is there are individuals who take it upon themselves to go to the schools and talk to the students about um, hygiene, about uh, their sexuality, and um, about uh, menstruation for, for, for girls, for example, and about their body changes as, as they become teenagers. And I was um, privileged to go to two schools where they, they, they did that. So um, community members are taking it upon themselves to actually provide this sexual education. Okay, thank you. There is a direct question to um, Pire here. It says, um, could you provide a bit more information about the European resolution that was mentioned, please? Pire. Uh, please unmute. Unmute yourself. So, so uh, on the 12th of uh, February, as I said, we passed a resolution against the, to abolish the uh, FTM in Europe, and we ask all the European countries, it means it's 20, but that time uh, uh, Great Britain was just left, just left by the end, but before they was involved in all the procedures. And we asked that all the European country have to, uh, to first of all, to deal with, uh, to, to look at what is uh, the situation in their own country first with the FGM, because some countries like East country, European countries in the East countries, Poland, Hungary, Croatia. I have been, for example, in Croatia at the end of January, and then when I spoke with the ministry, the women with ministry, she was sure that there was no FDM in Croatia. And we know that is, is not true because we made a uh, study. And what we want now is that that's the abolition of the FGM, but it's very difficult because we just give a uh, recommendation. That's a recommendation. What we have to do, what uh, each country has to do is now to make a study, to look at what is the situation in their own country. And now what is important in most of the European country, I listed, we listed all the country, I think there is just maybe uh, Luxembourg who doesn't have law because 
you know, it's always the same thing. People always say there is no FGM in my country. Everybody said is no FGM, but the other country, they all have a law and that's the law uh, that uh, migrants, most of migrants who are living in those countries, they have to know the law and for that we have to make as a, the, count, the member state have to uh, to inform migrant people, first of all, that there is in most of the country law, if you violated uh, that law, you will be punished. But what is much more better is to really inform what happened. For example, in Germany, my member state, we always say there is no no FGM in Germany, and we know now there is mm -hmm. FGM here in Germany. So, and that's what we have to to, to try to to bring the doctor and the midwife and the person who knows that happened that that uh, FGM was done in, in for example, in, in Germany, that they have to inform uh, and it's always a problem uh, uh, for the doctor, most of the doctor or the midwife, because they said if we say something, uh, we might uh, lose our uh, clients. The law is uh, now passed, but uh, all the law as a, as a law is a big recommendation and we hope now that uh, uh, the country where uh, they don't have law or they don't uh, until the, they never uh, deal or the, uh, never was uh, involved with that problem, that they are going to to look at what happened now really in their own country. That's the resolution. Oh. OK, thank you so but, much. Uh, oh. Have you? Yes, well, I'm just uh, in, in view of time. I think we'll just take one more question before yes. we have the respondents. Um, um, this is a direct question to Phil. Um, somewhat, Suzanne asking, is FGM still legal in Kenya? If it's been done in, host in the hospitals, what are the alternative rites of passage being suggested? Um, no, uh, um, FGM has been, it's not legal in Kenya um, and uh, it was, um, the, it was uh, made illegal by the Act, uh, uh, FGM Act of uh, two th 2011 and um, the reason why people go to hospital is because they say it's hygienic because a lot of times when we talk about uh, uh, FGM, um, we say it's uh, barbaric and they use um, unsanitized um, uh, tools. So a lot of people say, well, in that case, then we're going to make it hygienic um, and we're going to go to hospital. So um, in um, in Kisi, for example, um, the the, the alternative rite of passage that they do is the two week camps that the girls go to um, and then there's the organization that um, do, um, does the value centered approach where it gives reproductive um, um, reproductive education to the community and then in that sense in that case then they choose whether they can circumcise or not but then we have these camps where uh, the girls go, but it's only for about two weeks, but then they have to go back home. So as much as it's an alternative, sometimes when they go back home, um, it's not a guarantee that uh, the parents will not circumcise them. So um, the other alternative is just education, 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 and that's what different community members and of local organizations are doing. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll give the floor back to Maria. Um, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Kampu. And again, my absolute profound abject apology to all who, uh, who would have more questions to the presenters, who would have many more, you know, answers. And we have Animutu Dimenekeni, anti-FGM activist. A uh, survivor and public speaker, that is what the program here says. Alimutu, if you can somehow bring out perhaps what you felt to be here, particularly poignant, insightful, and what raises further questions, issues that we can take up in forthcoming webinars. Alimutu, thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for having me. And I would like to also take this perfect opportunity to thank our incredible um, presenters, but also as a survivor of FGM and knowing the work that has gone before me and hearing the names of my idols, um, Efwa Dokunu, Kadikwate, Kadija So, and so many other great women and even men who have actually paved the way. It took me 22 years to tell the world what my FGM meant for me. And that was not alone. And I'm so grateful and I'm so um, proud to be here and responding to the, the presenters and what I sort of um, observe and sort of the notice I got. So hearing from Giselle, the incredible nature of films in telling stories. And yes, for the first time hearing from girls, which for me was a challenge. No one knew what I felt and no one even asked when I presented myself in the UK at 18, going to hospitals and no one would listen to me. So it was very important in a film such as that of M. Giselle. And I love the title, you know, it, they are our daughters, it's everyone's daughter. Mm -hmm. But also what Miriam covered, Miriam saw of Forward in, in, in Senegal, shows the incredible force of work that um, communities um, do like hers in Senegal and why it's so important to give the grassroots the funding that they need because the voices of community can make that change and I was equally impressed by Phil and her research in Kenya Kisi and in so many ways Kisi is similar to my home country of Sierra Leone where um, FGM is also done by the Seventh Day Adventist Christians and Muslims alike but what I like most importantly um, from Phil's research um, was this solution, the, the, the community solutions to addressing FGM was very important. And I felt um, that the community themselves have accepted their role in this, in the change, in bringing that change. And I also, um, I, I learned something new, which I perhaps would also take on board when I go to Sierra Leone through my own organization, A Girl at a Time, bringing that focus within individual groups like the Christian church or the Muslim um, um, communities, we all have a part to play. But also, as always, Toby, I am moved and transformed by your presentation because it had everything I've ever hoped for, particularly <laughs> At 19, when I was inquiring about my FGM, I stumbled upon this film of Bintu in Paris. Mm. Though my French was not very good, but it was the catalyst that got me thinking how it felt for me as a diaspora in London and how I needed to get help immediately because I saw my father in Bintu's husband and I saw my mother in Bintu's mother or in Bintu herself because I, I was saved even though I was cut, but my mother would have killed to get to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, it shows the intergenerational challenges that we face, particularly those of us in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. We have left our home countries, but yet we hold on to a tradition that no longer plays irrelevant in our lives. But more so, what I also, I felt sort of inspired and knowing the way Dr. Piret Fofana took the novelist, the work of novelist in addressing FGM and why the political will in Europe, in fact, has been a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the United Kingdom has left Europe, but I think the, the basis and the foundation that the European Parliament has set, thanks to the work of yourself and someone like um, my colleague from Mali, the, the MEP, has been brilliant. And I think um, it is just the beginning. And I think despite leaving the European Union, the UK has a part to play. And if I may just say it now, because I don't know if our colleagues in this group may have heard, we now have Nimko Ali, who is now the gender advisor at the Home Office, an FGM survivor herself. So I believe today has been an opener for me and I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who has been part of this this webinar and the um, King's College London for setting the stone in which every momentum that, that will be carved today. And I think this is her historical moment 
and I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to take this opportunity to speak to all of you. But I guess we'll all meet again due to our time. I couldn't go further in my response, but I am so grateful to be here nonetheless. Thank you.